My name is Bill Maggio. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Jacobs Institute, um, the Executive Vice Chairman of the Board of Collada Health, and the Managing Partner of Lorraine Capital. Here in Buffalo in 2018, this new, beautiful new auditorium at the University of Buffalo, Jacobs School of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences, is a perfect venue for a discussion about the journey into the next quarter century of medicine. Late last fall, the Jacobs Institute published and released The Future of Medicine, written by a group of futurists who delved into opportunities to advance health and healthcare. As an independent nonprofit, the JI was the ideal catalyst for commissioning this visionary report. The JI's mission is to accelerate the development of next generation technologies in vascular medicine through collisions of physicians, engineers, entrepreneurs, investors, and industry. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. The JI was created by Mr. Jerry Jacobs, Sr., chairman of Delaware North Corporation and owner of the Boston Bruins, an honor and in the memory of his late brother, Dr. Larry Jacobs. Dr. Jacobs was a neurologist and an inventor who discovered beta interferon, which later became Abinex, the treatment of choice for multiple sclerosis. And while that discovery was made right here in Buffalo, its development and commercialization wasn't. And I'm sure you'll hear more from Dr. Hopkins about that in a moment. The Jacobs Institute compliments Mr. Jacobs' bold commitment to medicine, evidenced by his generosity to UB's medical school, where we sit today and which is named in his honor. Above all, the Jacobs Institute is rooted in collaboration and trust. The JI has cultivated relationships with its key partners, the University of Buffalo and Collida Health, since its doors opened in 2013. UB's president, Dr. Satish Tripathi, and Collida Health CEO, Jody Lameo, sit on the JI's board of directors. The Jacobs Institute is strategically sandwiched between UB's Clinical and Translational Research Center and Collider Health Gates Vascular Institute, thereby facilitating purposeful collusions, excuse me, I'll be all right, collisions. As future, <laughs> it fits with the times. Oh, Lord. It actually does say collusions in my notes, by the way. Just I, I'm only 50% wrong. As future physicians, you will need to collaborate with nurses, physicians' assistants, techniques, IT people, administrators, investors, and more in order to be successful. The same is true for the JI to be successful, and it's why we collaborate daily with hospital physicians and university faculty, whether neurologists, neuroscientists, biomedical engineers, or vascular surgeons. The JI brings together the brightest minds in one facility to streamline innovation. The synergies that are achieved when we work together are remarkable. Here are just a couple of examples. The JI collaborates with UB engineers and Collider Health physicians to create realistic patient-specific 3D printed vascular models that allow, that allow physicians to plan and practice procedures on their patient's anatomy before performing the actual procedures on their patients. Another example, together with Collider Health and University of Buffalo affiliated physicians, we broadcast live surgical cases around the globe. The JI in conjunction with UB and Collider Health host physicians from around the world who come right here to Buffalo to learn about new stroke treatments and protocols. And last but not least, certainly, the JI shares resources and expertise with a number of UB entities, including most recently the newly created Surgical Outcome and Research Center, which is a joint initiative at the Jacobs School of Medicine and UB School of Public Health. Now the JI is forging important partnerships with other institutions in the community and beyond, ranging from startups to some of the largest medical device companies in the world. These partnerships demonstrate the JI's conviction that collaboration is the key to innovation. And we will prove to you today that you do not have to leave Buffalo to be an innovator. We are fortunate to have a panel today representative of, 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 our, of, of, of our booming medical campus. They will explore cutting edge medical trends and how Buffalo is working towards the future of medicine. All this talent and visionary individuals you will hear from today are poised to usher in the future of medicine. It all starts here. I would like now to introduce Dr. Nick Hopkins, the founder and chief scientific officer of the JI. Dr. Hopkins is a SUNY Distinguished Professor of Neurosurgery and Radiology. He led the Department of Neurosurgery at UB for nearly 25 years. Is that true? Wow. He pioneered the field of endovascular neurosurgery 
and has trained more than 70 neurosurgeons in this technique who are now spread across the globe. Nick, please join me. Uh, does he need a mic? Yes, he does. Can you hear me? Here, you can have this. Oh, yeah, you can use that. Thanks, Bill. Um, well, just to follow up on his comment about Larry Jacobs, Larry was a colleague, neurologist, who started just kind of fooling around with some scientists, mostly at Roswell Park. And they were doing things with flow cytometry, and um, next thing we knew, Larry was doing spinal taps on patients on our ward at Millard Fillmore Hospital and introducing this foreign substance. We didn't even know what it was. It turned out it was beta interferon. Everybody, including me, thought Larry Jacobs was nuts. And guess what? It turned out to be the treatment for MS, for relapsing MS for many, many years. So. Would that have ever developed here in Buffalo at that time? No way, because we didn't have the infrastructure. And could it happen today? If, it, if that was developed here today, it would stay here in Buffalo, because now we do have the infrastructure. To my way of thinking, and I know we're behind schedule, so I'm going to keep this really quick, but from my way of thinking, there are two things that we need to ensure the future of healthcare in Western New York. One is, the infrastructure, and guess what? Now we have as good an infrastructure in this medical campus as anybody's ever had in the country. Nobody has a better infrastructure. There are bigger places like Houston, but they got five medical schools there, and, and it's, it's a mishmash of everything. Here, it's all coordinated. Thanks to the leadership of people like Dean Kane, Jerry Jacobs, Matt Enstis, this place is all coming together as one of the great medical campuses in the world. Second thing we need, we need great people. And one of the things that, that Jerry Jacobs has been so kind and generous to help us with is recruiting superstars here. There are some examples right here on this panel of superstars that Jerry has helped us to keep in Buffalo. And so it's those two things that I think we need to think about as what makes the future secure in Buffalo, New York. Innovation, um, where's that gonna come from? It's gonna come from you guys, from you guys. So bright ideas that you have that would lie fallow in many places, you've got the infrastructure and the resources right here in Buffalo, New York on this medical campus to take your ideas all the way through to proof of concept and launch them into companies that will help to build our infrastructure in Western New York. So with that, uh, let me shut up, and I'll turn it over to, to Adnan Siddiqui, who is our, the Jacobs Institute Chief Medical Officer. Um, unless you want to do the honors, Bill? I'll, I'll, I'll make it short here. Okay. Thank you, Nick. Thank, thank you, Nick. All right, Adnan, before you speak, also join us, obviously, Dr. Adnan Siddiqui. He is the JI's Chief Medical Officer. He is a professor of neurosurgery and radiology at UB and the director of neurosurgery stroke services at Kaleida Health Gates Vascular Institute and director of the UB Cannon Stroke and Vascular Research Center. Adnan is recognized as a world leader in the field. His expertise in medical device ev evaluation is highly sought after by world's leading device companies. Adnan, welcome. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, so uh, I, I think this was uh, a session that came about because um, um, Mr. Jacobs really wanted to make sure that we fed you. Uh, you know, his $35 million uh, that resulted in his naming, uh, the school being named after him, uh, is a reflection of his desire to do something truly special for Buffalo and Western New York. Um, and. The hope is that by showcasing what's going on right next to you, uh, we can excite you and entice you into thinking beyond what you normally would in the course of your studies. Um, what we are here to showcase to you is this incredible um, amalgam of uh, expertise 
that is within walking distance from you, all around you, that is already working together. This was not the case 10 years ago. This was definitely not the case 25 years ago, where we are now integrated with the School of Engineering. We integrated with the School of Management, with the School of Law, with the School of uh, Business, and the School of Medicine. Uh, we had integrated with Kaleida Health and with Roswell Park, and for that matter, for the Catholic Medical Partners. They don't have a campus here, but your faculty will come from all these different areas, and the little piece that reflects this relationship that we absolutely adore is uh, the Jacobs Institute, which is a little kitty corner from here in the middle of uh, the GVI, as Nick said, sandwiched between the GVI and CTRC. And what we are trying to do there is optimize the opportunities which are already here. We're not trying to reinvent any, any unique structure. It's just the talent that we have upstairs and downstairs and across the street is good enough uh, to match any other place on the planet. And I can assure you that every single day, we have the sharpest minds from all over the world coming to Buffalo for us to evaluate what they're doing and render our expertise. And it's not just the entrepreneurs. The FDA is coming here. The CMS is coming here because they really value this unique environment that has been created. And I think that's truly special because it gives us um, a vantage point which is unparalleled anywhere on the planet. There's no other academic institution that has the kind of expertise and exposure, at least on the vascular side and on the surgical side, to everything that's going on the regulatory side, everything is going on on the startup side. Um, and finally, before I turn it back over to Bill, um, I would say that please do not underestimate yourselves. It's a, it's a common fallacy. We are all, we, we all sort of are trained, and I'm sure Dean Kane is gonna change in his, the, the four years that you spent here with him, is that we are trained to be users. We are trained to be, um, um, users of technology, providers of care. Um, it is not a unidirectional process. If you look at all the great tales of wonderful landmark successes that uh, are spread throughout medicine, almost always the greatest ideas come, they start with physicians because they are the ones who are the users and the providers and the, um, uh, the, the, the seekers of opportunity. But if you suppress that instinct that is always with you every single day, um, it will go nowhere, nobody will be better from it. But if you harness that and utilize some of the opportunities that abound here in Buffalo, I think the world would be a better place because of it. So thank you very much for coming today. Yep. Uh, Nan, thank you so much. Thank you. So now we get the pleasure of meeting a futurist. When, when I was first asked to get involved in publishing this book, I said, what the hell is a futurist? I never heard of one. So we have one here today. I'd like to welcome Josh McHugh, editor and chief of Attention Span Media, uh, based in San Francisco, California. Josh is a seasoned journalist and editor, having worked for Forbes magazine, Vanity Fair, Wired magazine, Outside, and many more. He has also worked at advertising giants Wyden and Kennedy and Goodbye Silverstein and Partners. Josh joined Attention Span Media in 2008, I believe, yes. correct? That's right. Where he is currently CEO. Josh will illuminate us about the methods used to create the Future of Medicine Report. Josh, please. So like any good futurist, I've got a set of uh, index cards here with, with notes. Uh, the um, augmented reality system in my glasses is down. <laughs> so uh, congratulations on, uh, on starting your journey at uh, Jacobs School of Medicine. Um, it's fantastic. And um, 
I just, I, I, I'm here to give you a little sense of how we put this report together and what that says about the uh, level of innovation here in your, in your medical community. Um, uh, first, a little about me. I spent seven years at Forbes uh, and then eight years at Wired uh, writing about technology uh, and being an editor as well. Um, now I'm the, the CEO of Attention Span, and we are a, a firm that does research and strategy work uh, for a set of clients in the, the fields of healthcare, sports, and nutrition. Um, a year ago, the Jacobs Institute approached us about collaborating on uh, a project called the Future of Medicine. Um, and so we went out and uh, gathered together a group of uh, world-class science, technology, uh, healthcare journalists, and uh, a cutting edge team of designers as well to put this thing together. Uh, then we got to work. So when we started out, we, we've got a methodology and, and it basically goes like this. We look at the uh, technological forces uh, and socioeconomic forces that are most likely to have a big impact on any industry that we're looking at. So um, of, all the, of all the different forces and trends that, uh, that we saw having big impacts across a bunch of different industries out there, we, uh, we boiled it down to 26 forces that, uh, that we thought were gonna have uh, major impacts on healthcare. Um, seven of them were sort of fundamental computing-based forces, all, all results of, uh, of Moore's Law and its uh, children, its many children, which, have, which are sprouting up. Um, 11 of them were specific uh, medical technology innovations that, that we saw that we thought would be very significant. Uh, and another eight of them were global socio-demographic uh, trends that, that, that we saw happening out there. So once we had this list of 26 forces, we ranked them uh, in order of the degree of impact that we saw them having on the, the healthcare industry. Uh, and then we looked at the, 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 the real world that these forces have to move through. Uh, and that real world is composed of the, the stakeholder groups that make up uh, healthcare. Uh, and so we, we looked at all those and we ranked those as well in order of their adaptability, mobility, um, and at the bottom end of the scale, inertia. Uh, and so as we sort of matched up all the different forces against all the different, uh, different stakeholder groups that we begin to get a uh, a roadmap, and I got to say, at the outset, the roadmap looked pretty dark. It looked pretty grim. Uh, there are a lot of downward trends. Uh, I'm sure that everyone is is well aware of, uh, from say uh, obesity to uh, job loss uh, predicted from automation um, to what what to me was the most shocking. Thing that that I ran into, and and your uh, your your folks will be a little bit more familiar with it. But I, I was unaware before we started the, the, that project that there, there was a uh, sort of a crisis in physician morale, and so uh, it, it was a pretty daunting set of uh, realities that we were we were looking at at the at the outset of this thing. So once we had our our roadmap and had had sort of you know put our bets on what was going to happen first, uh, what was going to happen later, which, which things were going to be the most momentous. Uh, we hit the road. We went to the labs, uh, the startups, the VC firms. Uh, we we hit our own networks. It was a, a group mainly uh, comprised of uh, journalists and uh, and science writers. So we uh, we we went out there, beat the bushes. Um, hit the conferences and chase down the, the innovators that were behind the, the forces of change that we'd identified. Um, we looked in the normal, the, the places you'd expect, right? We, we were in, uh, in Silicon Valley, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, London, um, San Diego, which was definitely the most fun of all those. Um, 
What was uh, really surprising was that some of the most profound and, and uh, novel things that we learned along the way, we learned here in, in Western New York from the folks at the JI, uh, from the, the, the innovative approaches being taken at uh, BNMC, um, at, from the folks at Roswell Park, um, Collider Health, and, and right here at the U, uh, University of Buffalo. Um, so we got back together after, after uh, scouring the earth, and, uh, and what clearly you know, started to happen across the board was that the negative scenarios we had started out with before we dug into the innovation and uh, technology uh, progress that was, that was ahead of us uh, started to turn into positive scenarios. Um, we we looked at uh, we looked at basically a bunch of straight trend lines uh, on the negative side, based on uh, think you know things that have been happening in the in the recent past, uh, being uh, overtaken by the the curving uh, lines of technological innovation by this exponential growth in uh, several different areas, and so. Uh, Surprisingly to us, you, you know, if you if you look at the at the report, and I hope you all get a chance to, uh, you'll see that in almost every case, things start out a little bit scary, a little bit daunting, a little bit negative, uh, but by the end of almost every section, we we end up in some some very hopeful, optimistic places. So um, uh, just to, get, to, to hit that list of things that I, that I named before, obesity, you've got the CDC predicting that 42% uh, of Americans will be obese uh, by the year 2030. Um, we didn't agree. Uh, we, we looked and we saw uh, sensor-powered devices uh, combined with behavioral engineering, the, the kind we're now uh, unfortunately pretty familiar with, <laughs> thanks to our friends in social media. But um, that, that same science can be used for, for uh, not just good, but population health scale good. Uh, so that, that's one, job losses from, uh, from automation. Uh, I think if you're interested in radiology, you've probably been seeing reports about artificial intelligence outperforming individual radiologists. Uh, a study came out last week, uh, Stanford's developed a very powerful AI that that can outperform uh, the average of a panel of radiologists uh, by 22% in correctly identifying tumors. Uh, but what we then, what we saw was, okay, that's happening today, but what's happening in the future? Right now there's a, there's a new uh, strain of AI called Swarm AI, which harnesses uh, a network of uh, human experts and working on the same set of data, the Swarm AI outperformed the uh, AI alone by 33%. Uh, and we think there's a lot more of that coming. Um, lastly, on the, on the, the physician morale side, uh, the, the trends are all straight and, and not going up uh, into a positive place. But uh, if you look a little farther down the road, you see amazing assistive technologies that are being developed that are, uh, they're gonna address the number one factor that's uh, mentioned by doctors when, when talking about what, what uh, makes their jobs hard, and that is data entry and the, the, the burden of uh, handling uh, data input. And the reason is not because people don't like typing, it's because it takes away from the time that they get to spend uh, interacting with their patients and, and making their patients better. Um, and we see that changing radically in the, in the coming years, um, and not too far out on that one either. So uh, one thing that we noticed as well that we, we I don't think had, had recognized before is how incredibly entrepreneurial doctors are as a group. Um, you know, we're used to, to engineers, uh, but doctors are every bit as entrepreneurial and innovative, maybe even more so because uh, you know, where engineers often have a solution looking for a problem, doctors have plenty of problems that need solving. Uh, and uh, I would just encourage all of you to really take advantage of 
all the different resources you have here to come up with new solutions to problems that you're running into uh, because that's, that's what this community is all about. Um, so there's never been a time uh, where more is at stake, uh, not just in healthcare, but for our entire society. And truly the future is in your hands, uh, but the good news is that you're gonna have some incredibly powerful tools to shape that future. So good luck and thanks. That was fantastic, Josh. Thank you so much. Okay, now the fun part. How was lunch, by the way? I wouldn't know. I haven't eaten yet. It's good? All right, great, great. At this time, I'd like to welcome the panelists to the table here to my left and briefly introduce them. Now, if I were to list all their titles and accolades, we'd be here all day. Um, each panelist's areas of expertise aligns with major themes of the report and we'll get into a Q&A session as soon as I get them all up on stage. So first, uh, I'd like to welcome to the stage Dr. Michael Kane, Vice President of Health Science and Dean of the Jacobs School of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences. He is also a professor of medicine and professor of biomedical engineering. Dr. Kane can and will address the theme of teaming up and incubating innovation. Dr. Kane, welcome. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Steven Schweisberg. He is the chair of the Department of Surgery at the Jacobs School of Medicine he is also the director of, RISE, of the RISE Initiative, excuse me, and SOAR. Dr. Schweisberg is also the director of surgical programs at Great Lake Health. He comes to UB from Harvard Medical School in 2015, where he was professor of surgery. Dr. Schweisberg can address the theme of mixed reality. Next, I'd like to, I'd like to join from Roswell Park, I would like to ask to join from Roswell Park uh, Cancer Institute, Dr. Kershed Guru. Dr. Guru is chair of the Department of Urology and director of robotic surgery and director of the Applied Technology Laboratory for Advanced Surgery, or ATLAS. Dr. Guru is also the Robert B. Hubin Endowed Professor of Oncology at Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center. He will address the theme of surgical robotics. I am also pleased to introduce from the Jacobs Institute, Dr. Jason Davies. He is our director of research and assistant professor of neurosurgery and biomedic Biomedical Informatics at UB. He will address the theme of forecasting disease with data. We are also joined today by Dr. Norma Nowak, Executive Director of the New York State Center of Excellence in Bioinformatics and Life Sciences. She is also the founder and scientific officer of Vampire Genomics. Dr. Nowak will certainly address the theme of human genomics. Cletus Earle, that is a great name, is Vice President of Chief Information Officer for Collida Health he joins Collida after serving as VP of Chief Information Officer at St. Louis Cornwall Hospital. Cletus will address the theme of patient data security, a big challenge for all of us. And last but not least, Michael Springer. He's the JI's Vice President for Operations and Technology. He oversees the Idea to Reality Center, or the I2R as we like to call it. Michael will address the theme of additive manufacturing and 3D printing in medicine. Let's give them all a, wow, a, a warm welcome. Dr. Kane, we'll start with you. The Future of Medicine report identifies a number of strategies for moving from the present to the future of medicine. Two of these are by teaming up and incubating innovation. How is the Jacobs School of Medicine teaming up in order to incubate innovation locally? Thank you, Bill, and good afternoon to everybody. I also want to just add my thanks to the Jacobs Institute uh, sponsoring the Future of Medicine uh, event today and for uh, having it uh, be in the Jacobs School for the sake of our medical students. So with great appreciation, thank you. Um, my assignment was teaming up and, and, and uh, uh, incubating innovation. And the key word that I'll say twice at the beginning, and it'll be the last word that I say, um, is connectivity. And uh, to express how we're dealing with that important issue in innovation, I want to use as an example our interprofessional educational program, which has as its goal uh, educating healthcare uh, students um, and uh, having them take that knowledge and have it result in interprofessional clinical care. And using that transition from education with research in the middle to provide evidence-based data 
and converting that to improved health care for the community um, is the theme that I'm going to spend two or three minutes on. So we're fortunate here in, in Buffalo and at UB um, to have five health science schools and other uh, units within the university that are very, very involved and, and committed to interprofessional education. This effort is led by education deans in each of the units. Uh, Lisa Jane Jacobson, who's sitting here in front, uh, really heads um, the school's activities in this area. But Lisa Jane and her counterparts uh, in the five health science schools, plus the School of Law, plus the School of Social Work, plus the School of Management, have really put together a state-of-the-art interprofessional education program that allows students in all of these units to interact at appropriate times during the year with two big events, one in the spring and one in the fall each year, where in the course of a day we actually educate over 900 students in timely topics. And the one that I want to use as an example is opioid dependence. So as you know, this is a huge um, uh, uh, national community and medical problem, uh, and these groups have come together uh, to address that. Um, what we learned from these kinds of interactions, as well as interactions with the community and other researchers and clinical care deliverers in the community was the following. For treating opioid uh, addiction uh, and overdoses uh, in the Buffalo community, there's a wide variety and broad range of services that exist. Many approaches are well-meaning, but very few are evidence-based. Despite all valiant attempts, there is a lack of coordination and sufficient access to care. Overdose rescues increase daily, save lives temporarily, but relapse is a certainty without ready access to ongoing treatment. There are serious treatment gaps in subpopulations that include patients with chronic pain, uh, uh, women who are pregnant who are addicted to opioids, and adolescents. Medication-assisted treatment is available but grossly underutilized. Workforce is inadequate, as well as the educational needs of that workforce. And there's regional awareness of limitations in response and willingness to partner and to change. And we want to change all of that through connectivity. So the economic toll of opioid addiction, as you know, is increasing. It was at a national level, 29.1 billion in 2001, 115 billion in 2017, and will be a total of 500 billion over the next three years. Local government pays a little, state government pays a little, federal government pays a little, more than 50% is paid by us industry and the private sector and individuals. So this is a huge problem with the uh, economy and the toll that it takes. Um, so what are we doing about it through both interprofessional education and through the medical school and universities broad approach to this with the community? For the short term, we've discovered that emergency room physicians are the first line of help. They're the entry point to rescue and treatment. Addiction specialists should be consultants who provide timely access to detoxification, evaluation, and stabilization of patients long term. Primary care physicians provide ongoing maintenance care using addiction specialists as mentors and consultants when troubles arise. And through connectivity, today as we sit here, there are 13 hospitals in Western New York, including Collida, ECMC, uh, the Catholic System, and others. There are 15 service provider sites, 60 open appointments now made available a week. And now if you're seen in the emergency room, with, emergency room with an overdose, you are guaranteed an appointment at one of these connected sites within 24 hours. And this model is now embraced by the New York State Department of Health and being replicated uh, and hopes to be replicated across the country. So the university addiction services and trying to help be our, uh, do our part in the community is filling critical service gaps for adolescents, pregnant women, and chronic pain patients, using and developing evidence-based treatments, connecting with referring 
connecting with and referring to and informing existing regional services, training the workforce in clinical sites, achieving designation as an addiction medicine foundation, center of excellence in addiction and medicine. And all of this is finally starting to have an effect. So in the big picture, when you look at um, the total number of deaths that were occurring in 2016 and now in 17 and 18, there's already a 17% decrease. Now, you know, you can't say this is all direct cause and effect, but it is a community effort led by uh, the university and the school and our community partners who care greatly about this community. And again, an example of how you bring people together with diverse backgrounds, but a common passion and a goal to make a difference, connect them together, and you have innovation and good things that occur. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. King. <clears throat> very, very important topic indeed. Dr. Guru, I understand that you have some time constraints, so we're going to jump over to you. The Future Medicine Report notes that currently, robot-assisted health plan surgery and or aid the surgeon in performing it by enhancing dexterity or removing the surgeon from dangerous environments. And I would suppose uh, that radiation and endovascular procedures might be a good example of that. As haptic feedback, visualization, and device dexterity improve, robots will increasingly take over more tasks for any given procedure. Which tasks do you anticipate robots taking over the next 5, 10, and 20 years? And how is your work informing this process? Dr. Oh, thanks uh, so much. Well, uh, first, I want to thank uh, the Jacobs Institute, Adnan, and uh, uh, Dean Kane uh, for this opportunity. Uh, I think the opportunity for our students is incredible. Everybody you see on this table who basically is a professor, when we came into medicine, we were on one track. You studied biology, you studied cell biology, you studied anatomy, you studied physiology, and you learned how to take an instrument, cut an organ out, and that was the end of the story. Things have changed, and uh, I jumped into robotics about 15 years back, and the future belongs to the students who are here. Why does it do that is because of what you heard before is integration. A person who has an undergrad in engineering or computer sciences or has studied computer vision or any form or shape has studied artificial intelligence will be very critical for the future of medicine. Now, how does that apply to robotics? Surgical robotics right now is very primitive. You sit behind a console, it excites you to see 3D vision, and you have a remote control uh, of these instruments. <clears throat> that is just the beginning and we've kind of scratched the surface. What is gonna happen is the human machine interface is evolving and it has evolved over a decade. And as you know now, when you see a Ford Motor Company plant uh, kind of assemble a car, you see nobody around that. Remember that site, because that's what's gonna be the future. But what is gonna happen is that future is gonna be developed by all of you. Human machine interface, artificial intelligence, computer vision uh, will lead to develop navigation-based feedback. What is navigation-based feedback? Navigation-based fe feedback is something, if you look up our research, some of the papers we have published, where we do EEG activity of my brain while I'm operating. What's gonna happen is this EEG activity will be connected with the student. And when the student or the resident is performing, uh, their EEG will match with our EEG, and the master surgeon's EEG will be prompted that the trainee is off track or the trainee is not confident. And if you look some of our work, we developed a program we just published in scientific reports for trust, trust in the field of surgery. It's not going to be any more that the chief surgeon lets you know that this is what I feel, you're ready to graduate. That's not gonna happen. It's going to be AI and it's going to be all of that which is going to sh fire all these algorithms based on your EEG, your eye tracking uh, is gonna decide that are you ready to be operating uh, on the patient. Now, if you take it a decade further, what's gonna happen is that all of this is gonna be taken over by computers. All it's gonna ask you is that we took the scans of the patient, we feel that this is how, based on our intelligence or millions of computer vision files, 
and your brain activity that this is how you would do this case, and it will render an automated preview of that case. And all you would do is you would basically just say, yes, I agree or I don't agree of that key step. Once you agree to all of this, all you have to do is push a button, sit back, and watch the show. And that's the future, but it's not here. So it's not scary to hear that, wow, am I obsolete? All of you will develop all of that. What we have done, I think, in our generation is probably laid the foundations of all of this. And unfortunately, I didn't read the report, but this is the research we are doing at Atlas. This is the research that's happening at UB uh, School of Medicine and JI. All of this will get integrated, and you have the opportunity to walk into this building from any field, from humanities to design to computer vision to computer science to anatomy to surgical science and integrate all of it to create the future of surgery. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Guru. Exciting, exciting stuff. Dr. Davies, the Future Management Report predicts that in the future, AI algorithms will be able to use combination of lifestyle and environmental data, genetic propensities, and biometric tracking to predict most major disease, sometimes even years in advance. What are some of the advantages you see in predictive analytics? And what are some of the roadblocks in making this happen? And you are a dual trained neurosurgeon. How are you using data analytics in your work, Dr. Davies? Thanks, Bill, and thanks for having, uh, having me here for this discussion. So um, I love data. We've already heard alluded to the fact that there's data all around us, and, and, and certainly medicine is no uh, stranger to data. You guys, the med students, are, are sort of involved in understanding the minutia of the data out there. When you're in the clinic, you're going to be involved in sort of assimilating and, and bringing together all the different, the vitals, the, the labs, all the, the imaging data. There's data everywhere. Unfortunately, in medicine, we're, um, we're underutilizing data integration. We're underutilizing the ability to, uh, um, to, to use advanced algorithms to be able to understand it. So when we think about the future of medicine, I think it's real easy as it relates to data because medicine is far behind what industry has already done. We can look to your favorite store and mine, Walmart, uh, and say, okay, well, what has Walmart done with data? What has Amazon done with data? What has Google done with data? And that's where we need to go. Yes, there are roadblocks. Yes, there are privacy issues. Yes, there are um, issues with data sharing. But um, there's a whole lot that can be done. So you think, about, um, you think about Walmart. They know exactly what you're interested in buying because they're able to bring in data from their own stores, from your social media accounts, from their cookies that are tracking you across different places. And they're able to understand what are you looking for, what are you interested in, what are your friends also interested in, therefore might be influencing your buying habits. So, so they offer you a great deal on something that they know that you want. Great. Now you go into the store and you pull it up on your app and, and, and um, it's going to lead you to where in the store it is. And of course it knows that in addition to the barbecue, you're also interested in Nerf guns. And so it's going to lead you by the Nerf gun aisle to get to the barbecue. They're using data, bringing it together in a way that they can achieve their goals of making more money, selling more widgets. What are our goals? We want to improve the health of, of, of the people around us. We want to improve the efficacy of our care. We want to understand who needs treatment and who doesn't. Um, those are things that uh, heretofore, it's been the gray hairs and the great minds that have tried to assimilate as much data as we can, but the human mind can only hold so much. You know, we can think about six or eight variables at a time. The computer can take into account millions. So let's use the computer for what it's good for. Let's assimilate across and be able to do things like predict who's going to have a stroke, who's going to get better from a stroke, and, and, and what flows from that. Well, let's intervene. Let's use those sort of high-intensity, high-resource interventions for the folks who are actually going to benefit and hopefully improve the health of the entire population by targeting those who might benefit most. We think about, you know, uh, uh, Bill posed a question about uh, uh, neurosurgery. So I do um, vascular neurosurgery, um, and we're interested in things like strokes and aneurysms and vascular malformations and things that cause bleeding in your brain. And um, there's a lot that we can do. We've got uh, uh, the ability to bring in um, decades worth of imaging data and to be able to let the computer help us to understand where's the problem, 
Does it need to be fixed? What's the best way of fixing it? When are you done fixing it? And when do you need to come back and fix it again? I think there's just tremendous opportunity um, to be able to uh, get away from the, well, I hope this is good enough, or I hope this works, and get to 80% chance this is gonna work if you do this, that, and the other, and the computers are what are gonna help us to get there. Thanks. Jason, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. <laughs> Dr. Schweisberg, the future of medicine report calls out mixed reality. It's one of the computing technologies that will transform the future of medicine. What are some of the ways this technology will do this in terms of medical education and medical practice? How are you integrating mixed reality into your work as a surgeon and educator? Dr. Schweitzberg. Uh, Bill, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Adnan, Josh, <clears throat> we have a whole collection of Wired magazines going back a long time. We, we hate throwing them out because they're, they're so fun to read. I, I think the key word is mixed. And um, our, our strategy is to take fields of work, such as medicine or, or surgery, and mix them with something else. And so we do that, and we create what is known as associational thinking. If you're a Clayton Christensen fan, you know, he writes about it a lot, intersectional thinking. And that's how we, why we built UB Rise, Research Innovation, Structure, Simulation, Engineering, and Education. It's why we built UB Surge, Department of, Engin uh, Department of Human Factors in the School of Engineering up on the seventh floor of this medical school, working with the Moog up on the seventh floor. It's why we built UB SOAR that we put in the Jacobs Institute, Surgical Outcomes, School of Public Health. And it's why we're working with the law school because we have all of this technology. I'm not sure we know what to do with it because the Walmart scenario, Jason, is, is actually pretty, pretty scary. We, we do it in our residency because we want to train surgery residents. We have a Surgery Plus program where we have residents getting their Masters of Engineering, Education, Public Health, Business, and, and Bioinformatics. So to get to the, to get to the strict answer, for me, uh, augmented reality reflects that associational thinking of taking two disparate ideas and mashing them together. That's innovation. Steve Jobs didn't in invent the cell phone. He didn't invent the iPad. He took ideas and he put them together in novel ways. So we wanted to do some of that. And so we took um, augmented reality. We have a headset. Um, I don't have any, any conflicts. It came from Meta. John Warner was here last year talking about that. And we took something that we know very well, surgery, and we took our video systems. And I'm not really worried about radiologists because surgery is the most fun you can have standing up. So there'll be plenty of good things to do. And with robotics, you can have the most fun sitting down now um, as, as well. So we wanted to take these two ideas that are pretty different, an augmented reality headset that gamers are interested in, and the operating room and, and mix them together. So if you have a slide for me, I have one slide. Perfect. So this is the work of uh, Tran and, and Yayu, if you're here, um, upstairs on the seventh floor where we attempted and were doing this of marrying the meta headset to our surgical video display. And, and what you can see, if you look up in the corner, there's nothing in her hands. But what you're looking at in the center is the view through the headset. She thinks she's looking at the surgical feed. This is simulated feed. What we want to be able to do is put the surgical feed in the augmented reality headset and then take advantage of all the other things that augmented reality can bring to us, such as the toolkits, and then control our environment. Simple things, for starters. Turn on the lights, turn up the insufflation, take a picture, start the video, manipulate the CAT scan, look at the MRI, on and on and on and on and on, because we want to move augmented reality from a niche, overlay the CAT scan tumor to the video, to a commodity, use it every single day of, of our lives. Now, why do we want to do that? If you think about going into the operating room and watching minimally invasive surgery, the monitors that we use, whether it's 3D or up on the screen, haven't changed in 50 years. They are fundamentally no different than the black and white TV that your parents looked at. Yes, it's in color. Yes, it's higher resolution. Yes, it's 3D. But these are all dumb terminals. By mixing AR and surgery, two very different ideas, and, and mashing them all together, 
we can now start to interact directly with our image and start to control our environment. In our previous lab, we had somebody from um, IBM and we wanted to control the vascular images because we work in the sterile field. Well, we want to be able to manipulate those images without having to take off our gloves, flip through the CAT scans, and the only way we're going to be able to do that is to build interfaces such as what's available in, in AR. So this is a demo. We're almost ready to show it to the key players that we've been working with. We actually have a goal of spinning out a medical division from this AR company, doing it right here in Buffalo, and build uh, MetaMedical you know, right here. Turns out the, the grandmother of one of the principals lived on Richmond Avenue, so she's got Buffalo roots uh, too, and take these inter ideas and turn them into jobs and, and the work in your everyday life. So look forward to seeing you all on surgery rotation. It is not nearly as scary as what they tell you, and it is truly the most fun you can have standing up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Schweitzberg. Dr. Nowak, the Future of Medicine Report identifies a gene editing tool and a gene expression editing tool, CRISPR, in addition to epigenetic enhancements, as being among the medical technologies that will shape the future medical landscape. Can you talk briefly a little about each and how they will impact medicine in the future? Thank you, Norma. Sure. So let me give you a little background. So when I first started training in human genetics, it was 1985. Now that to you must seem like, oh my gosh, she's that old. But think about it. Back then, there were no cell phones. There were no laptops. There weren't even desktop computers. So when the Genome Project got rolling, it really meant we had to develop technology, which was hardware and software, to decode that human genome. And that one human genome took about $4 billion and 15 years. So today, you can walk into a lab about two blocks away, work with me, and you can sequence that genome overnight. So how do you think I feel? I can now do that overnight, which took me 15 years and all of that money for about $1,000. But that technology has led us to technologies like CRISPR-Cas gene editing. So the dream when we sequenced that human genome was to actually be able to cure genetic disorders, treat cancer, so today, there are tools, and they're called programmable nucleases, which allow us to go in and alter the genome of cells, or the message that the genome generates. And they'd say, well, why do you care so much about this? Well, you, we all go through life thinking that, you know, I've got it all planned out, life is, you know, I'm gonna do this this time, this, at this point in my life, I'm gonna marry someone, have a wonderful family, great careers, we're set. Well, I was training in part at the Roswell Park Cancer Institute, met a great guy, got married when I was in college to a Buffalonian, and he came home from work at one point, said to me, what is, do you know what this lump is in my neck? So we were 36 years old at the time, and he was diagnosed with what they'll tell you, and I can remember the doctor at Roswell Park saying this, it's a very curable form of cancer. If you're going to get cancer, this is the one to get Hodgkin's lymphoma. Needless to say, two years later, he died during a bone marrow transplant. So all that training in human genetics and training at Roswell Park, do you think I was a little angry? Very angry. But I'm sitting here today to tell you that you take that passion and you aim it at something. So what we did was we really took what we were learning from the Human Genome Project and focused it on how do we better enable patients to be stratified how do we tell where they fall? In a, you know, in other words, do they have non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? What type of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? What type of leukemias? And today, we can actually, you know, three years ago in Europe, there was a toddler who was basically given about a week to live in London. It's, her name was Layla Richards. And she was given the ability to use it was compassionate care by a company, Selectus, in Paris, which made, now, believe this, off-the-shelf off donor T cells. And those T cells were engineered such that they would block the graft-versus-host disease, and they were programmed to go after the leukemia cells that express CD19, so an antigen. So part of the work that I did when I was a graduate student was on developing PSA here in Buffalo. So the first human genome that was sequenced started in a lab a couple of blocks away, and it was a Western New Yorker. PSA was also one of the you know, big biomarkers. And again, tumor-specific antigens, CD19, 
same story. So today, we can go in, train cells to find those tumor cells. That little girl is given those off-the-shelf cells from this company Selectus. She is today alive and well. Three years later, at some point she may have to be given another dose of those cells, but she was given off-the-shelf cells because she didn't have enough T cells herself for them to harvest them. So today we had, that's called CAR T therapy, and I'm sure most of you who have, you know, have studied oncology or who perhaps will go into that field are aware of it. But we can also go in and cure heritable disorders. So last, earlier this year, there was a, a trial set up at UNC to look at Hunter syndrome, which is a lysosomal enzyme storage disease. And these individuals die usually by the time they're a teenager. So they were able to actually, again, take and genetically engineer cells, so using programmable nucleases, which literally do a cut and paste of DNA, and correct the gene, infuse it into the liver of this young man, and he's doing very well. Now, none of these therapies are without caveats and side effects. Some people do much better than others, but it's a whole, it's, a, it's literally like, so what do you think one of my favorite science fiction movies is? Gattaca, anybody seen Gattaca, right? So the modified versus the unmodified. But I think with all technologies we have to think about, there are all these ethical considerations around it too. So people have said to me, I've got students who are like, well, what's normal? Well, you tell me what's normal, right? Genetics is all about variation. So I think curing a child with cystic fibrosis, those are the things that we should pursue. You know, we talk about, one of the things Bill asked me to talk about was epigenetic enhancement. Yeah, I would love a cream that I could put on my skin that would turn on some genes to make me look young again. But at the end of the day, what I'd really like to do is, you know, again, discover ways to cure diseases that have just, you know, haunted us for years. And we now, in a relatively short period of time, we're there. So I often say, I wish, I wish I was only born like 25 years later, because the things that you guys can do are, were just, you know, they were dreams when I started out in human genetics. And you now, you're going to go through medical school between the computational tools. So for all of you, learn, a pro learn how to program. And I tell kids this, we should teach kids programming when they're in grammar school, middle school, because it's going to be part of your life. You're going to have to take data and electronic health records. You're going to have to have, be able to mix it with genomic data and pull out the answers. And it's all, that's still really hard stuff to do, but we're there. So, you know, I'm, I would love to meet with any of you who want to meet me at some point in time, show you what we do over in the lab at the Center of Excellence, and talk to you some more about, you know, where you sit in the world right now and where you possibly could go. Because honestly, I just wish I was born 25 years ago. Thank you. Thank you, Norma. Always so inspirational. And Cletus, I'm sorry you have to follow that. <laughs> <laughs> the Future Management Report, Cletus says that in 2009, over 80% of the country has moved to electronic records. And to my surprise, 245 different EHR systems are in use today. But the data ended up in silos, as we all know. HIPAA laws and anti-kickback statutes also continue to prevent information exchanges. It also says that 2.3 million Americans every year are victimized by medical identity theft, most often by someone using their identity to get prescription drugs or medical services. How can we reconcile the need to make it easier to share patient data between providers and the need to make patient data secure. And what is Collider Health doing in this area? Cletus. Well, thanks, Bill. Thank uh, you. First and foremost, I want to thank you, B, for um, being invited to speak to such a, with this, such a distinguished panel. So thank you very much there. Um, interesting that you say that. You know, you, you mentioned um, 2009, we started this journey, and 80% is, you know, is using electronic medical record. If you think about that for a second, the banking industry took over 35 years to completely digitize their system. And guess what? They are only about over 90% done. So we've been able to do something in less than 10 years that some other verticals or industries have not been able to completely do. And I don't think we do give ourselves enough credit when it comes back, you know, when you look at that. And needless, needless to say, we still have a long way. There's a lot of lessons to be learned from our transactions, but we don't, we don't do that enough. And I think it, it's an indication of Moore's Law. It's a, that technology doubles 
every 18 months, and it's just going to continue to skyrocket. There's going to get, become an inflection when things are going to be there. And it, it, you know, we talk about the future, but the future is now. And I think you've heard about that many times already, that we're at that point. And I would encourage you all to truly, and I'm not speaking selfishly because I'm an IT guy, but more of this is the new norm and it's going to be something that we're gonna benefit from. So to get back to the question, as far as you know, what are we doing? I have, I have the, the honor to be not only the CIO for Collider and Great Lakes Health, but I'm also the chairman of the board for CHIME, which is the College of Health Information Management Executives. It's the association for all CIOs, CTOs, CMIOs, CNIOs around the, the globe. We have you know, thousands of members and we're represented in 52 countries. So part of my effort there um, on CHIME is to truly work with On the Hill in Washington, D.C., is to really help relieve and um, uh, relax some of the regulatory burdens that we have when it comes to security, because that's part of the challenge. We talk about disruption. Right? We talk about moving fast, but it's created some, some issues when it comes to security and you know, breaches that we've seen. So we, we really need to remove some of the regulatory burdens, but also push to modify or, in essence, adopt standards. And the standards that we're really pushing on the Hill right now are the NIST standards, which are these, these government-based standards that are used across all types of verticals like the federal government and you know the military. Using these standards will help us basically get on the same page. And, and, and again, I think that's one of the pieces that we can actually help push the dial there. Um, we also have to think about using technologies such as blockchain. Anybody heard of block blockchain? Well, if you haven't, you've probably heard of cryptocurrency and all of that stuff. That's the piece, that's, that's the framework blockchain works on. Do believe we're at the, you know, the infancy stage of using blockchain in the healthcare area to protect that data, to make it more secure. It's, again, we are just pushing the dial here. I think there's a lot, a lot more to learn or to be had regarding these kind of technologies to help you know, thwart some of the challenges we're having across the globe when it comes to cybersecurity and some of the threats associated with um, theft of data and um, protected health information. There are a couple other areas, such as artificial intelligence. We've heard that already today, but we do believe AI can actually be used from a threat intelligence side to be able to monitor data and information and seeing patterns, um, what's happening on the dark web, and seeing when information is breached and hacked, and being able to use the computers to be able to do something about it, actively stop and um, identify and stop some of the issues that are occurring around the globe when it comes to our data sharing or the illegal version of our data being shared. And then there's other areas such as facial recognition at um, in Collider. We are actually doing some really cool things. And actually, I talk about blockchain and now and AI and facial recognition using some of these technologies to be able to know who's actually coming down, you know, coming into the, the organization, help try to prevent uh, it's called doctor shopping. I'm pretty sure you guys heard about that with the opioid crisis that we talked about, Dr. Kane. And, and using the technologies to help notify, you know, the authorities or you know, the physicians, the practitioners, the providers, to be able to mitigate the risk of exposure to an opioid crisis in a, in a more timely manner. So we do believe using these technologies is a actual helpful uh, supplement to what's to be had in order to answering your question. It's not one end all be all. So Kaleida, what are we doing? You know, I talked about the big picture, but there's an even bigger picture of what we're doing in Western New York. Kaleida, along with UB and ECMC, we are, we are actively looking at changing the model. We're saying that we understand that part of our Great Lakes health of Western New York, we're looking at creating one medical record. One medical record to allow that there's a different patient experience. It, it's interesting, um, one of our physicians asked medical students, uh, residents and, and, and all of the folks say, when you're doing your rotations, how many different EMRs you, you learn throughout your course because you're going all around? And it was alarming to find out, in some cases, 
people were learning five different EMRs while you were going through your process. And I see some head shaking. Pretty sure you all feel the pain. And the key here is what we're doing in Western New York is changing that. You know, not for the entire region, but for a good portion of the health system to say, let's get onto that one EMR experience. Let's change the care. Let's be able to make it a one, one care experience so that we can change the expectations or the experience that you feel, but also our patients are experiencing, right? Imagine that they don't have to register in 10 different systems, I'm exaggerating, or having you know different type of outcomes by us as an institution, as a region, getting onto one common EMR platform. We are, we are, we've kicked those things off. As a matter of fact, we did one of our kickoffs in this room, so it was really, really pretty cool having this entire two rooms filled. We are, and we are encouraged to know that this EMR experience will change the way we take care of our patients and more importantly, it will change the standards that we actually start to mandate because if we put standards in place across a care continuum, then we also can actually tie security to that as well and philosophies and practice and how people log in, how people are acknowledge and access control, we call it, and then be able to securely put some frameworks in place for the entire region. We're really excited for that. Thank you, Kalidas. Thank you very much. Last but not least, Mike Springer. The Future of Medicine report identifies digital and additive manufacturing, uh, 3D printing, as a technology that will shape the future of medicine. What are some of the main ways that 3D printing will do this, and how is a JI using 3D printing to transform medicine? Thank you, Bill. And I'm looking at my watch now, so I realize I'm going to try to keep things a little brief. I'm sure we're losing some people. Um, but hopefully everyone has enjoyed the, the session. It's been an honor to be part of this. Um, the stories are compelling. Um, so, you know, normally your story is just, uh, you know, I was almost tearing up, so I'm glad I have to go after you. Um, but my role, just to give some background and looking at the, the audience I hear today, is my, my role fundamentally is engineering and product development. Um, so I've actually sat on the other side of that table, but as my wife is a clinician, so I always say I, she's the smart one. I'm the one that tries to work with her and ask her annoying questions like, why does it work that way? Why can't you do that? And I've been doing that for years. And, now coming back to Buffalo, really have this place called the Jacobs Institute that has everything in one place at the right time. Um, so what I mean by that, so back to how we'll get to 3D printing, is 3D printing is a tool. And to develop new transformational technologies introduced by this amazing report, the future sounds extremely exciting, but it's like a place you don't know how to get there. You know, like what do I do now? Someone else will figure it out. I think that was touched on a couple of times here today very well. Um, it's the empowerment that you have to be part of the solution. It's that, the, I mean, back to knowing your story, it's that, that buy-in that you have to make this happen, but it's really hard to do it by yourself. So the partnerships and all these things you see in these fancy marketing ads are not, are not fake. They're, they're being practiced every day in the buildings around you. If you're not aware of it, ask. You know, come to things like this and go over across the street. Um, the beauty for me is now everything's in the campus. I grew up in Rochester, New York when everything was kind of, you know, Kodak and Bosch and Lam and these empires that just ignored empires, ignored innovation, went up, went up in smoke, right? So I moved away and came back when um, a certain person, you may know by the name of Dr. Hopkins and, and all these people here, um, sold me on this idea, and that's all it was, was an idea of a building that could combine clinicians, the people that have, as Adnan Siddiqui said, the people that have the problems can be with the researchers and the engineers but then the missing piece is the catalyst. How do you bring it all together? How do you connect? And that's what the GI tries to do is bring people together and primarily my role and our team's role is to understand those intersections and how can 3D printing in terms of the question I asked, they fit into those intersections. So back to 3D printing, how many people today own a 3D printer? Well, of course I do, I own a lot of them, so. How many people have printed something? Okay, so that's amazing. So when I went to school, as much as it wasn't you know, to, to that long ago, but say 15, 20 years ago, I didn't have a 3D printer. I didn't have experiences like this. Um, when I first got a 3D printing, it was actually at Amazon. So I was at Amazon, and this is another unbelievably transformational story of someone that's really understood, um, back to Dr. Davies' comments and several others, the user experience is the key to value. Staying that close to the customer is key. So in 2012, they were talking about 3D printing books and 3D printing parts and anything in all their factories, their distribution centers. And I was like, 3D printing, what's that? That's crazy. It's in the internet everywhere. And now you see it everywhere, right? So that was only six years ago. 
And now the answer is you can 3D print almost anything. You can 3D print widgets at home. You can 3D print food. You can 3D print guns, a controversial topic, right? So back to all these cool tools, there's the good side, and then there's this interesting other side, like digital rights management and all these other things that are, I'll talk about in a minute. But coming full circle, there's areas of aerospace and what I would call automotive manufacturing, the mainstream centers that have embraced 3D printing. Now you gotta realize why is medicine so far back? Well, also because it's a completely different marketplace. The risks are different, developing products are different. The hospital doesn't understand a 3D printer, but the researchers do, but do we wanna put the 3D printer in the hospital? How would we manage that? You step back from that and you realize though, back to why we're in medicine is there is value there. There's value in surgical planning, which is some things that GI does a lot of. There's value in 3D printing vascular models to improve the way products are developed and the way physicians and other clinicians and parties are trained, like industry, big strategic, startups. For years, they just used typical models to develop tools, such as silicone perfectly round tubes to develop vascular devices to treat stroke or to treat um, other vascular diseases. Your body, as you guys, either first year or second year, right? First year healthy system, second year disease system. They're not static, the, the body is dynamic. So our focus is to use 3D printing as a tool to leverage the experience in the building and the rapid feedback from all our clinicians and people like yourselves, because I or my team cannot develop a tool without feedback, without data. Uh, and the clinicians and that rapid iteration in 3D printing allows us to do it fast, effectively, quickly, and now we're 3D printing disease state vessels. We're, we're, we're actually taking micro CTs of the inside of the vessel, breaking that data down, building it back up into the vessel, and developing these models as products themselves. But most importantly, to develop medical devices with these products, because that's how they test if they're safe and effective. So there's a lot of excitement about 3D printing, and I can go into more on that, but mostly what I want to be able to convey today is it's something that we believe is the way to disrupt the way medical devices are developed. It's a tool, and the tool is not ready, it's not perfect. Um, and back to surgical planning, which is really the future, this exciting thing that people um, talk about in conferences all over the world, um, the conversation always comes up is, why can you 3D print Adidas sneakers? But there's very little 3D printing in medicine. Yes, there's implants. It's because the process is extremely, reg extremely regulated and difficult. That shouldn't stop us, right? So the partnerships you have in this room can change those things but only through working together. And I'm very execution focused. That's my rule at the JI. I'm an engineer slash operator because ideas are great, but that's all they are. You have to work with the right people at the right time to actually carry it from an idea to a reality. And that's something that we're working on. And the people in this room are here to make it happen. So that's kind of my overall you know, discussion on 3D printing. Switching to the JI a little bit, if you guys ever wanna come over to the JI, understand how we, use it to pull cloths out of models or implant uh, valves or different types of applications. Um, we're actually using this to develop devices that will save people's lives here in Buffalo. And it's happening in Buffalo, which is kind of a pinch factor until you see it, but it's real and it's all around you. So I'll try to wrap it up quickly on that, take questions around 3D printing. It's a very broad topic, um, but that's you know, my two cents and I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Michael. All right, so we're, we're about 10 minutes over, and I, don't, I know you all have class and everything. We have, an, obviously, another round of applause for this entire panel. They are fantastic. <laughs> you will realize shortly, as you get more involved in this community, just, just how impressive it is to have this collection, these collection of individuals here and to have their time. And, and I'm very grateful, not only for what you do for your respective institutions, but what you're doing to transform healthcare in our community. Thank you very much. So we have time for one or two questions. If anybody wants to ask questions of the panel, we certainly would. Uh, I think we have a couple minutes to entertain questions, guys. Is that okay? Okay, so we'll start back here. So uh, the panel tasked us students with uh, tackling these problems of uh, medicine in the future. In what ways are these issues um, going to be integrated in future medical curriculum here at UB? I think that's a great question. I um, just had the opportunity to come back from France, from the University of Strasbourg, where <clears throat> they put on a, an amazing course. Connor Arquette took it, Jean Yang took it, where they mix engineering students with uh, medical students and give them a challenge at the beginning of the week. And they work all week long to solve this challenge. 
and I you know, got to the end of the week, it was an amazing week, I realized we have all the pieces here. We have the engineering school, we have the, uh, the Department of Biomedical Engineering, which is dual in the med school, and the School of Engineering. We have the entrepreneurs, we have all the pieces to replicate what is known as the best course. So we are very much interested in integrating here at the Jacobs School of Medicine, University at Buffalo, integrating these disciplines to provide these kinds of opportunities like you. And we hope to be able to put on our version of the best Buffalo course uh, sometime in the near future. If I could ask, uh, just add one thing to that. I think the biggest curriculum piece that we can do to help you guys to get involved is simply to leave you alone and say, come across the street and talk to us, right? It's, it's um, not everybody has the same interest. Not everybody wants to program. Not everybody wants to do genetics. Not everybody wants to do whatever urologists do. So the point is, find your passion. Come explore your passions. You know, the, the, the strength of this medical campus is that everything is right here. Look on the website, figure out who's doing something that's interesting, and go talk to them and get involved. And I think that's how you're going to um, be, be part of developing this new future. Amen to that. We have time for one more question. Who's going to close us out here? You? Are you raising your hand? No? Anybody? All right, in the back there. Well, one of the things I've noticed about data entry is that uh, people press buttons like no clubbing, cyanosis, or edema. And that may or may not be the case, that it's um, within normal limits becomes we never looked. And you have a, an image uh, data that doesn't actually reflect the individual in front of you. Could you speak to that? So if you don't mind, I'll take that. Yeah. So y you're right. You know, we do, as we continue to encourage people to use these systems, they have to slow down. They have to, you know, be more mindful. And this is where artificial intelligence and the computer solution could actually help, in essence, identifying when these, these anomalies are occurring that don't match up to the patient experience. Again, we're not necessarily there, but as, as a matter of fact, part of our Great Lakes Health Investment, we're really talking about using tools that are going to actually help in those scenarios. So this is, this is where other people are seeing the disruption is causing harm in some cases, and the technology can help identify and help us remediate where those, those um, anomalies occur. Thank you so much, Quidus. Okay, again, for our panel, thank you very much. We have one last thing. I think we're going to raffle off a couple of gift cards here. And before I do that, I want to thank you all for being here. And I want to wish you the very best of luck and a wonderful afternoon. I'm going to call some names out. Thank you again for coming.